This free program is paid for by the listeners of Redwood Community Radio. If you're not already a member, please think of joining us. Thank you. Information available at Golden Dragon Medicinal Syrup at gmail.com and by phone at 707-223-1569. And coming right up, it's Ask Your Herb Doctor. Well, good evening and welcome to this Ask Your Herb Doctor. My name is Andrew Murray. And my name is Sarah Johannesson Murray. Uh, For those of you who perhaps uh, never listen to our show, they run every month, the third Friday of each month. Uh, My wife and I, Sarah and I, are both licensed medical herbalists. Uh, We graduated in England uh, with a degree in herbal medicine and we run a clinic in Garberville where we consult with clients about a wide range of different conditions. And we manufacture all our own certified organic herbal extracts which are either grown on our CCUF certified herb farm or which are sourced from other USA certified organic suppliers. So you're listening to Ask Your Herb Doctor on KMUD Garberville 91.1 FM and from 7.30 until the end of the show at 8 o'clock You're invited to call in with any questions, either related or unrelated, to this month's unusual, perhaps, topic, all based around milk. Um, If we get time, a little bit later on, um, there were certainly some questions that have been asked um, uh, about the topic of cancer. Um, But surprised to say that had a, uh, a listener who has been tuning in regularly to the shows, actually, from Rio de Janeiro, so she's doing this on the web, and... um, she had a uh, had plenty, plenty of different questions about milk and milk consumption, uh, and there was arguments for and against milk. And a particular seminar that was given by uh, Pedro Bastos, who was part of the uh, Paleo uh, Eat 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 the Paleo Diet, and kind of uh, I don't want to say anti-milk, perhaps, but um, we'll come we'll come up with that a little bit later. Anyway, suffice to say that Dr. Pete. Uh, has been kind enough to join us again on the radio show this evening uh, from 7.30 to 8 p- to, until 8 p.m. Um, we take callers and are very happy to hear from you. And those people who have questions related or unrelated to the show uh, can use that time wisely to ask Dr. Pete his advice about many different things, perhaps if it's not just around milk. Anyway, uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Pete, are you, are you with us? Yes, hello. Hi, thank you for joining the show. Um, Again, as usual, perhaps there are people that haven't listened to the show before, so would you just uh, introduce yourself and give an, uh, a rundown of your professional academic background? Um, I studied physiology in the biology department, University of Oregon, and uh, I've been interested in endocrine biology and many other themes in biology since I was a little kid, but I, I didn't study it academically until... Uh, 1968 to 72, because uh, I had a, a bad opinion of American biology uh, from uh, my experience with high school biology, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've I've been reading uh, lots of other national traditions and such in biology. Uh, so uh, I take a, a critical approach to most of the things that I read. 
Yeah, good job too, huh? Okay, well, so I think probably some of tonight's, the reason for tonight's show was perhaps uh, some erroneous science that was thrown uh, as a, a kind of curveball, um, suggesting perhaps that there were inherent problems with um, using milk and or I know that the people uh, perhaps who are uh, lacto-vegans or vegans uh, would certainly um, perhaps benefit to hear um, your opinions uh, surrounding milk and I've got lots of different questions uh, so far as points that were brought up in a seminar given by a Pedro Bastos who's part of he was uh, presenting a, a talk on milk and had various different quote unquote science surrounding uh, falls and against uh, some of which we will we'll get into so um, in terms of I know I know that you're very um, big on milk you you're, you're an advocate of drinking milk um, I've never consume so much milk I don't think in my life apart from when I was young I, I very much enjoyed drinking milk um, but kind of grew out of it as I think perhaps most people do but inherently there's such a lot of positive benefit from drinking milk that the anti-dairy or the uh, pro-soy groups uh, would probably be just as well to listen and tune into this month's show because there's plenty of evidence to show that milk is actually very beneficial for you and it's perhaps uh, in our best interest to make sure that we can uh, get, back in, get back into drinking milk again if we don't, if we've for one ever reason or another we stop drinking it. So about some of the arguments against milk, I know that uh, in, in Pedro Basto's article he mentioned that um, insulin growth factor was stimulated fairly strongly by milk what do you what, what do you have to say about IGF and or its uh, its stimulation from milk how true is that um, well it has some of the uh, features of insulin and um, but it's it and insulin are just uh, two of our uh, regulatory uh, factors that um, when when one of them is is um, slightly distorted, we have so many other uh, regulatory systems that uh, nothing really changes much when when one is a little off center. Okay, so you're saying that there's uh, no real significant um, effect from the uh, stimulation of IGF by milk as opposed to the stimulation of IGF by other other things that we would normally cope well, with or when you look at the functions in a given species um, animals that are very big for their species have a, a high level of IGF okay like elephants and well no a, no. a big mice oh, okay a big mice <laughs> and <laughs> elephants have a very low level um, oh, okay so it's it's uh, within a species it has one kind of effect but uh, across the spectrum of of possible animal species it has a very different meaning okay and so it's it's just part of a system and our our whole system has a uh, long range adaptive processes uh, and nutrition has hardly scratched the surface of of how nutrition works in developmental bio biology uh, the most nutrition research uh, is done uh, for the agricultural food industry. Uh, they want to know how to make big animals, not, right. not intelligent, long life right. animals. You know, like, like the cows and uh, the, uh, increasing the increasing the yield from a cow, both in milk and uh, meat. Yeah, and yeah. Um, some nutritional studies um, have found that uh, your grandmother's uh, nutritional level affects the development of your brain and so on. And in animal studies, you can see it going on for four to five generations mm -hmm. of the way a, a diet uh, and the development of one individual uh, goes. The uh, You can see the influence generation after generation uh, affecting the uh, development of the whole animal. Mm -hmm. but, Focusing on the size of the brain, for example, right. you can't 
determine anything really just in one generation. Is, is this genetically passed on then without actually being... Um, well, currently they're thinking that it's um, methylation of the genes, okay. uh, but that's just the, the right. current <laughs> variation on, on how genetic uh, influences work. Uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, I knew uh, Carl Lindegren, who wrote the book Cold War in Biology, and he published a, a survey of, of experiments showing such things as a transgenerational influence or the influence of a plant's nutrition on the heredity and development of its offspring. Uh, things that uh, in the United States, uh, Barbara McClintock was showing that stress affects the genetics of a corn plant. But uh, Carl Lindegren was uh, reviewing older, much more radical stuff that, that shows that you can uh, change uh, the nature of, of a t tomato plant's offspring by what you do to the tomato plant. And uh, that, that since genetic engineering uh, became a profitable business, Barbara McClintock was brought out of obscurity, given a Nobel Prize and a MacArthur grant, so that the uh, Monsanto people would have uh, someone saying, that, see, this happens in nature. <laughs> okay. So when Pedro Basto says, oh, milk is bad because it stimulates IGF. There is uh, not really enough science to, to know. Uh, it might turn out uh, four or five generations from now that it is either good or bad. Uh, for example, uh, people who drink milk might have uh, great-grandchildren who are uh, much smarter than they are. <laughs> well, so basically, this is a, a postulation or a, a theory that he's proposing and not really backed up by scientific evidence, especially when you look at cultures who do drink a lot of milk and they have less cancer, because that's the whole thing with IGF is that it, it could well, Pedro Bassos is saying it's a stimulator of cancer. But it's also a stimulator of healthy uh, tissue growth. Okay, so it's out of context. He's, yeah. is, he's uh, taking it out of context. For example, a study of the uh, radiation effects in Japan, they looked at all factors of uh, life situation and diet and so on, and they saw that people who didn't drink milk had a much higher uh, risk of becoming demanded in old age. And... Uh, a later study in the U.S. saw the same thing, that milk has anti-dementia hmm. uh, properties. So is there any anti-inflammatory component to it, that, or, um, or is it another mechanism? Which they, they don't really know. That's <coughs> just a, a, an association right. of, of the big populations. Uh, but it could involve something like the IGF, but uh, there are so many factors in milk, just the high, high ratio of calcium to phosphorus is mm -hmm. one of the extremely mm -hmm. beneficial mm -hmm. qualities of milk. Yeah, well, I know you're very big on calcium uh, uh, and for many different reasons, so perhaps uh, that would be a good point for people to hear. In, in terms of the calcium content of milk and how easily a bioavailable it is, compared to uh, how you would get the sufficient calcium level from other foods, that's probably quite an interesting... Uh, um, well, the next best uh, food, which people don't think about is food usually, but it's uh, eggshell. Uh, I had a, a relative who uh, cured his fairly youthful osteoporosis by having a tablespoon of powdered eggshell every day. Which would be about, uh, what, 5,000 milligrams of calcium a day? Something like that. And that's in the neighborhood of what the Maasai people uh, get during their lifetime, five to 7,000. As an average? You, yeah. So one quart of milk has about 1,200 milligrams of calcium, right? Yeah, and then a whole eggshell is maybe 2,000 milligrams. And uh, that is uh, calcium carbonate, but the absorption of the calcium in milk is greatly improved by the presence of lactose in the milk. When you compare the different mm. sugars, uh, fructose is uh, not as good as as lactose, but it still is uh, an important factor in helping to absorb calcium. Uh, 
glucose or starch, starch breaks down into nothing but glucose, uh, starch has a very poor effect uh, on glucose or on calcium absorption. And when bone development was compared in rats that were made deficient in vitamin D, uh, one group was given starch as its carbohydrate, the other was given sucrose. And despite being deficient in vitamin D, the sucrose-fed rats had strong bones. So sugar doesn't weaken your bones like we're told. No, it, it actually works right. parallel to a thyroid and vitamin <clears throat> D for uh, stimulating the, the metabolism, uh, which uh, calcium uh, T3 component of the thyroid hormone and uh, fructose all have some overlapping effects uh, activating respiratory metabolism. So people who drink lactose-free milk um, will not be absorbing as much calcium as people who drink normal milk. Right. And what about people that would say, oh, I'm <coughs> lactose intolerant? How would you, uh, how would you answer that? Um, studies of, um, for example, in Chinatown in San Francisco, uh, people who hadn't grown up drinking uh, milk com were compared to um, people who had uh, the, the, the same family, same genes, mm -hmm. but it's just a matter of uh, what you grow up exposed to. And when you take someone who has grown up without it and have them drink uh, maybe a, a glass and a half total milk in a day, about half a glass at a time, in just two or three weeks, they are inducing the enzymes in their intestine. And uh, when you look at uh, various factors responsible for losing the enzymes, a deficiency of progesterone and thyroid or a bacterial infection. Of the will, small intestine? Yeah, will cause the, uh, hmm. the loss of those enzymes. Okay, so the bacterial infection, that, that, that can directly cause a lack of enzyme production then? Yeah, and th that usually <laughs> develops in the upper part of the small intestine mm -hmm. in and people who are thyroid deficient. And then those people, when they drank milk, would have terrible gas because the bacteria would be digesting the lactose instead yeah. of the lactase from, that should be normally produced from the small intestine. Yeah. But even those people can regain the enzyme though? Yeah. Okay, because, I mean, I, I do come across, as Sarah, you come across people who just point blank refuse uh, to drink milk. They say, I can't drink it. It gives me cramps, digestion, bloating, etc. <clears throat> but those people can retrain, retrain themselves, you know, retrain themselves. They can actually start to express that, that, uh, that enzyme. I, I found that once they get their overall nutrition in a better state, mm -hmm. it becomes easier and easier for them to digest the milk, or is it... They're, if, like Dr. Pete said, they're quite low thyroid to begin with and they um, have a lot of gaseous issues and intestinal dysbiosis or bacterial overgrowth, then it is very, it's harder for them if they aren't willing to change other aspects of their diet. And starch tends to support the bacterial overgrowth more than fruit sugar. Okay. And now, if, if someone, if someone uh, <coughs> given that you said progesterone uh, is very helpful and thyroid in... Uh, in, in being able to digest milk and or produce the enzymes, why would somebody, as a question, why would somebody want to drink milk? Why would somebody want to be able, if they you know, want to use the argument that I can't digest it, I don't, you know, it doesn't do me any good, what, what, how can we convince people that milk really is a beneficial? Well, can we go product? back to calcium, Dr. Pete? Can you tell us the, um, all the beneficial anti-inflammatory effects that the calcium alone has that's present in very absorbable quantities in milk and, and the different health benefits. Because when we think of calcium, we think of, oh, it's just good for your bones. I don't need to worry about that till I turn 70 or whatever, you know. Yeah, um, um, Adele Davis uh, talked about that in the 1950s, that people uh, think of, of calcifying kidneys and arteries and such and are afraid of the calcium in milk, but she already pointed out the research showing that the people who drink the least milk or have the least calcium in their diet have the, the most kidney stones and the most <laughs> calcified arteries. And that's because of the anti-inflammatory effect of calcium. It suppresses the tendency of your kidneys and arteries and other soft tissues. 
And is that extra calcium that's getting deposited in the arteries and causing calcification of the arteries and kidney damage, that's coming from people's bones, right, in, in response to a deficiency? Yeah, the calcium in your in diet, diet by uh, having the anti-inflammatory and pro-thyroid effect is uh, tending to direct the de- deposition of calcium as calcium carbonate into your bones and uh, keeping the production of, of carbon dioxide up by stimulating cell metabolism. Uh, the same carbon dioxide that deposits into the bones uh, prevents calcium from uh, depositing in arteries and kidneys by keeping it in a soluble state. So if you take enough in your diet, then it moves in the right direction and goes from the milk to the bone. If you don't, then it goes from the bone to your arteries. Yeah. The un- wrong way. Un- unfortunately, I think a lot of people have a incorrect association with it. And uh, I know one person in particular who was uh, we were working with a couple of months back had, I think, extremely bad osteoporosis and was so anti-milk because they thought, oh, I can't cope with any more calcium. I, I can't cope with the calcium. Um, one of the factors in osteoporosis is, um, if not high cortisol, then high prolactin. Uh, and both of those are caused by high serotonin. And uh, all of those, uh, serotonin, prolactin, and cortisol, uh, are anti-bone formation. And uh, calcium suppresses all of those. Uh, calcium in your diet suppresses mm-hmm. prolactin cortisol and serotonin, uh, allowing uh, the uh, other bone building factors to be dominant. So let's talk about the sugar in milk and how that's, that helps your liver function better and your, then your liver can manufacture more carbon dioxide. The engineer just had a question about ways to increase carbon dioxide. Um, any sugar, uh, if, if you uh, eat sucrose, it's similar to lactose, not quite as effective for absorbing calcium as the lactose is, but the sucrose in fruit or honey or uh, just plain sugar is um, 50% fructose, 50% glucose, and it just takes a little fructose to catalyze the um, more energetic burning of uh, glucose producing carbon dioxide. Uh, So you don't have to eat a pure sugar uh, carbohydrate diet to, to have optimal uh, carbon dioxide production, but it's okay to uh, avoid starch entirely. Okay, yeah, so in terms of um, keeping a CO2 up, the uh, not, not engaging too much in aerobic exercise, this is certainly um, part, of, part of someone's uh, goal, I think, if, uh, to, uh, to maintain high CO2. I know you've mentioned bag breathing before now to re-inspire expired air as a way of increasing your CO2. And um, I know we've, we've touched on other things like high altitude, um, high altitude being very beneficial because that is also going to increase a person's and CO2. Something as simple as baking soda right. uh, stimulates bone formation. So, and what's the mechanism for that? The carbon dioxide. Okay, just, just the carbon dioxide. And that's why for um, broken bone treatment, <coughs> uh, CO2 treatment as mm. a, um, an infusing gas that you basically put your broken limb into a bag that's filled with carbon dioxide. Yeah, you know, the well, body has such an affinity for carbon dioxide that even though there's a very high concentration inside your body compared to the atmosphere, if you uh, put your arm or leg into a bag of, of carbon dioxide, it'll flow into your body. Uh, same with uh, carbonated hot springs. Mm-hmm. Uh, you absorb carbon dioxide out of the water, mm-hmm. up the gradient, into your body because your body basically uh, has an affinity for it. And when you uh, move into a, a high altitude or happen to live in a submarine for two or three months, uh, your bones, even after months of, of uh, the body having a higher CO2 uh, concentration, the bones are still incorporating some of the CO2 out of your blood. 
That's why I feel so good when I go to the local <laughs> hot springs, carbonated hot springs, Vichy and Ukiah, Vichy hot springs, because it's carbonated, <laughs> it's um, water that's high in CO2. Okay, that brings out another point, I think, just to keep reiterating it, because I know that um, your, your own research has showed this to be a self-evident as well as a uh, scientifically evident truth, is that people really need to start looking at oxygen uh, unfortunately, looking at oxygen as a poison, uh, metabolic poison, if you like, and looking at CO2 actually in a better light than we normally associate CO2 with. I normally, I would always have thought CO2, you know, if you breathe it out, it's bad. You don't, you know, you don't live on CO2, but actually, it's very beneficial for us as organisms to have a higher concentration of CO2 than we do. Um, and people living at a very high altitude, uh, once they've adapted if they go up gradually uh, the blood coming out of their lungs is more completely oxygenated uh, hmm. because of the uh, various things the effect of carbon dioxide seems to uh, improve the diffusion of the gas mm -hmm. from the air into your uh, blood capillaries in the lungs so it helps them absorb more oxygen is what you're yeah. saying yeah and then the cell will work more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're listening to Ask Your Herb Doctor on KMUD Garberville 91.1 FM. Uh, from 7.30 until the end of the show at 8 o'clock, you're invited to call in. Uh, Dr. Ray Peet is joining us again on the show, uh, and this month's topic is uh, pretty much surrounded milk and the benefits of milk, uh, trying to refute some of the arguments of the uh, paleo evolutionists and I probably think that's a better another question Dr. Pete people um, I know have said in the past well it's you know as a human race depending on what you, where your viewpoint is as a human race we've been around for millions of years and only very recently have we started drinking milk um, what would you uh, what, what would you say about that um, well the first thing is that um, a lot of people have their imaginary uh, history of the human race. <laughs> uh, uh, Conrad Lorenz and uh, a couple of his followers, uh, uh, Ardrey and Morris, uh, described the uh, evolution of the killer ape as, as where we came from, that uh, a carnivorous ape uh, uh, made the uh, transition into uh, hum humankind. Uh, so meat was was the basis of of human evolution, and uh, other people are currently saying that uh, uh, Africans uh, who lived along lakes or or sea coasts ate uh, fish, and the, the brain is made of fish oil, and so <laughs> they needed needed to eat fish to evolve a big brain. Okay, but uh, all of that is really. Uh, reading backwards into history from whatever people uh, believe in the present. Okay, because I uh, talking about the uh, uh, um, gosh, I don't know the early civilization when um, perhaps we would have been moving out of the caves and becoming uh, d domesticators of animals and growing crops. Grains also would have been a fairly recent. Yeah. In, yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty well <coughs> documented that for the last uh, ten or twenty thousand years, civilizations have been uh, knowing how to domesticate uh, grains of different kinds, and uh, that is, uh, I think, it's the the good basis for the starting to think about the paleo diet. Uh, that definitely grain eating hasn't done anything great for the human brain or, or general health. Uh, so uh, as far as, as the uh, caveman diet uh, takes people away from a grain-based diet, I think it's starting off in the right direction, but there's just not enough uh, science yet to, to know what the long-range effects of uh, a given diet are, are going to be for sure. And one of the things we can see in a fairly short range is that uh, one of the bad features of the grains and nuts uh, diet is a high phosphate 
content, mm-hmm. high fiber, right, and calcium ratio. And even a high meat diet has a yeah, high fiber. Yeah, a high meat diet has that same drawback unless you eat eggshells when you eat the eggs and uh, uh, maybe chew on the bones. Uh, some people eat chicken bones. So that, uh, that brings up grass-fed milk versus grain-fed milk. Then the milk that from cows that are being fed alfalfa and grain then would be um, less desirable than grass-fed milk, correct? Um, yeah, the, uh, the, the fresh uh, grass has a, a high ratio of vitamin E to uh, fatty acids. And uh, the uh, grains, especially if they've been stored for a while, uh, the vitamin E is fairly quickly depleted. And cows need vitamin E in proportion to the fatty acids because uh, the bacteria which destroy the polyunsaturated fats uh, in any any uh, plant material like grain or, or leaves, uh, the um, bacteria hydrogenate those polyunsaturated fats in the cow's rumen so that 98% of the polyunsaturated fat is destroyed by the, the cow's bacteria if they have enough vitamin E. Right. Huh. And you're saying that fresh grass has more vitamin E than the grain yeah. and the yeah. alfalfa. Yeah. How about... Um, That's why milk tastes good from damp, wet, rainy <laughs> countries. <laughs> so lots of lush grass. Like I know in South Africa, England. when I spent a year there, the milk tasted mm-hmm. terrible. <laughs> I don't know if I ever saw any green grass the whole time yeah. I was there. Same in Israel. I remember the milk in Israel was pretty bad. <laughs> okay. So how about um, uh, people... I know we're, we're very strong advocates of eating organically uh, wherever the organic alternative is available. Uh, I know the same would be true for milk, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, um, uh, mentioning Israel, um, they, up until uh, they did this uh, study, I think it was in the 1960s, they had uh, the highest or one of the world's highest rates of uh, breast cancer. Mm. And uh, they uh, noticed that uh, their dairies were using I think it was lindane. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> they love their pesticides. Don't they? As soon as they banned the use of that around their cows, mm-hmm. as it had been banned previously in the U.S., their breast cancer rate came down to about the European and U.S. level. Wow. Yeah, unfortunately, they do enjoy their uh, their, their petrochemicals. <laughs> I know in agriculture, is uh, the agriculture 20, 25 years ago was pretty reliant on... Uh, lots of different sprays for their crops and I think it was just fairly normal for them to to do that. Okay, uh, it's 7.30 now. If uh, any listeners listening uh, have any questions for Dr. P about the subject of milk, uh, the number here is uh, 923-3911 or there's an 800 number which is 1-800-KMUD-RAD which is 800-568-3723. So uh, talking about hormones and or Estrogenic, estrogenic type effects. Uh, what's the uh, what's the truth in the presence of estrogens in in milk? And that would be some people's argument for not wanting to tr- consume it. And, and that's, let me just preface this with estrogen being a known uh, carcinogen or cancer promoter. Um, the amount in uh, milk is maybe something up to as much as one microgram per quart. Uh, but uh, men, uh, estrogen really is, is as much a male hormone as female. And the uh, natural estrogen is processed uh, in both men and women uh, and detoxified fairly quickly. And about, I think it's 85% of the estrogen in milk, even though it's a very small amount to start with, a birth control pill, for example, has 30 micrograms, and uh, so you, no one drinks 30 <laughs> liters of milk in a day. But uh, the uh, bulk of the estrogen in the milk is attached to either sulfate or glucuronic acid, uh, which prepares it to be excreted in the kidneys. Okay. Uh, we do actually have a caller on the, on the air, so let's take this caller. 
Actually, they just dropped, although now a different line is ringing here, but it's an office line. I'm not sure. Call back caller. And somebody also asked, what about homogenization? Of, uh, yeah, homogenization that's, that's of another milk. good question. I was waiting for that question. <laughs> <laughs> so homogenization versus uh, pasteurization versus, I mean, how about raw milk? Let's, let's start with homogenization and then go on to raw milk. Um, the um, process breaks the particle of fat up into such a small size that it uh, doesn't separate uh, by itself. And that presumably is going to make any of the unstable fats in it oxidize okay. faster. Huh. So uh, it has a, a small uh, harmful effect, but uh, considering the alternatives, if, if you go into a, a grocery store that has only uh, homogenized pasteurized milk and... Uh, what are the other foods that you'll find in the supermarket as alternatives? Uh, they're all going to be much more uh, dangerous as oxidants or pro-oxidants. So the, the theory, or I've heard this theory, that, oh, it breaks the fat molecule up so tiny that then it goes in and blocks your arteries, so that's complete rubbish then? Um, yeah. Um, the, the, if the fat particle gets into your artery directly, um, when, when we secrete uh, bile, that, the, the uh, soapy material in the bile breaks up all of the fats that we eat anyway into particles uh, of about that same size, which do get directly into the bloodstream. So we have our own natural homogenization process with yeah. our bile that our liver makes to help yeah, us exactly. digest the fats. Yeah, that's what the chylomicron system is. It's homogenizing. <laughs> Okay, that's a brilliant answer. I like that one. <laughs> so then um, raw milk, you would consider raw milk increased in nutritional value over the pasteurized and the ultra-pasteurized and all yeah, the other treatments? Yeah, definitely it's nutritionally better, but uh, that doesn't mean that you should uh, eat soybeans or, or bread or something if you can't get milk, can't get raw milk. Right, because you're weighing up the... The pros and the cons. And also, too, of course, it depends what the cows are eating, like we talked before about grain-fed versus grass-fed milk. Yeah, that that's makes a big difference. Uh, if you are getting milk from a dairy that has only one or two or three cows, uh, what the cow ate uh, the preceding day is going to have a big effect on the taste of the milk, the allergenicity, uh, and how well it keeps and so on. But if you have a, a thousand cows milk being pooled together, it becomes a standardized uh, product that is pretty invariable. And sometimes people find that, I've had a client who said that they didn't like to drink, they, they didn't digest Holstein milk as well as they did Jersey milk. And when they drank the Jersey milk, they have absolutely no problems and they can drink as much as they like. So, I mean, that depends, too. And from dairy to dairy, every dairy is feeding their cows maybe slightly different food or maybe cows are eating slightly different grass or other weeds or there's lots of different things that can affect the milk. Yeah, everything in the cow's environment uh, affects the nature of the milk. Mm. The hormone content varies according to the cow's stress level. Okay. But, um, they talk about that very tiny amount of, of estrogen as a concern, but uh, most milk has at least 20 times as much progesterone as estrogen. And so if, if you did get some uh, active estrogen in your milk, mm -hmm. uh, the amount of progesterone is more than enough to uh, counteract its effect. Excellent. Okay, there is a, a caller on the line, so let's just take this next caller. Hello, you're on the air. Hi, I would like to address the question of the uh, nutritional value of, of goat milk and fresh goat cheese. Um, I understand that it's, I feel like it's less mucus forming, and um, I'd like to uh, ask your speaker to address this question. I'll um, just talk to us about goat products. I'll take my answer off air. Thank you. Thank you. The, the composition is definitely different, but again, it depends a lot on what the goat was eating. Um, 
when I was a little kid, one of our neighbors uh, came back from the war with um, malaria, and they had goats. And uh, as soon as he uh, was able to drink his his uh, daily goat milk, he didn't have any uh, malaria attacks. But uh, periodically, he had to go uh, to the veterans' hospital for a, a checkup. And once when he was there, he uh, had a malaria attack, and they wouldn't let him get his goat milk, and he died from the the attack. Wow. So uh, um, I've heard that the goat milk protein is a smaller, more easily digestible, like the sheep's milk protein, compared to the cow's milk protein. Do you find that, in your experience, Dr. Pete, that people, you've known other people who have an easier time digesting goat milk versus cow's milk? Yeah, I've heard that quite a bit. And do you think the, the size of the protein strand is what it's down to? I doubt it. Uh, I think that there are so many uh, chemical differences that uh, I wouldn't uh, guess what was most important. I know that sheep's milk, when you look at the nutritional profile, it's very different to cow or goat's milk. It's only got more fat. It has a lot more fat and a lot more and protein. protein yeah. But um, <coughs> when you compare, just if you're just looking at the protein and the fat and the goat's milk, it, it's, it's pretty similar. But I guess, again, that depends on what they're eating and which cow's milk and goat's milk they tested. Okay, so going back to uh, milk's calcium content and how physiologically important calcium is to us as organisms, it, and you've mentioned eggshells as being another excellent source of calcium. Is there anything else if people refuse to drink milk and they refuse to take powdered eggshell caps to get their calcium? Is there What else do they have to do and how much to, in order to satisfy the nutritional needs for calcium as its anti-inflammatory effects? Um, if you eat... Um most of your carbohydrate as fruit um, and avoid the grains so you aren't getting excess phosphate, mm. then uh, probably an eggshell a day will uh, give you all the calcium you need. But where, where else could you get that amount of calcium if you uh, refuse to use calcium as an egg, egg, eggshell supplement? Please? Oh, um, I suppose... Um, just a, a leaf-based diet would uh, right. eventually get enough just, calcium. No, right, just dark green leafy veg. Mm -hmm. But you'd probably have to eat a fair amount of it to get the same. Yeah, and it, it, um, if it's well cooked, you uh, get more of the nutrients. Right. The experiment where they, they gave rats a, a vegetable diet uh, of fresh vegetables another group had exactly the same vegetables that had been canned and uh, the ones getting the canned vegetables uh, lived perfectly well and the others uh, wasted away <laughs> couldn't, huh. couldn't assimilate the nutrients yeah okay oh, we got i think we have another caller on on the air so, so let's see uh, if we take that caller now hey thank you very much uh question was regarding evaporated milk and the thickening agents commonly put in there, mm. like uh, carrageenan and there maybe xanthine gum or something like that. Um, that's what I was uh, wanting Dr. Pete to comment on. And I'm thinking, you know, I'll take my answer off the air. Okay, thank you for your call. Dr. Pete? Yeah, the gums, um, in particular, uh, carrageenan. Uh, I've got an article on my website about carrageenan. Um, a, a few years ago, probably three years ago, uh, one of the organic cream uh, producers that, that most of the grocery stores uh, stock, uh, I started getting sick on their cream and uh, saw that, that they were using carrageenan in their thick whipping cream. And uh, same thing happened with uh, some of the ice creams I had been eating for years. Uh, they made me sick, and I looked at the label and saw they were adding gums. And uh, the uh, many of the cheeses are adding uh, those uh, as uh, carriers for the uh, flavoring agents, culture, uh, microorganisms and such uh, to make it easier to produce the cheese. Uh, and the um, dairy often doesn't realize that 
the uh, culture organisms may be suspended in alginate or terogenin. And uh, one researcher has demonstrated in uh, many animal experiments that uh, terogenin is carcinogenic, but uh, the FDA and, and various agencies allow it to be used in food because they say it's only the degraded carrageenan, which is carcinogenic. And when bacteria in your intestine act on it, they degrade it. But when it goes in your mouth, it's according to the FDA, not carcinogenic. And what about evaporated milk? Has that just become more oxidized and broken oh, down? Oh, sure. And uh, contact with a can is another possible source of contamination. But uh, the, the reason it tastes so bad is that it's heavily oxidized. <laughs> Okay. All right. We do have another caller, so let's take this next caller. You on the air? Yes. My question was about uh, sprouted uh, grain breads and sourdough breads. Um, Whoops. We lost Oops. you there. Are you on the air still? Engineer, oh. is he still there? I think so. Are you still there, caller? Well... The line's still open. Well, uh, well, Dr. P., what about sprouted grains and uh, sourdough? Does the pre-fermentation help? Well, yeah, the, um, the, just the soaking process, um, activating the enzymes in the dough, even if it's ground and can't sprout, uh, 8 to 12 hours of being moistened, allows the enzymes to uh, activate the same process that would happen, happen in sprouting. And so the uh, phytic acid, for example, is broken down into inositol and phosphate. And gluten is partly broken down uh, so that if you soak the bread too long, you don't get a, a light, uh, spongy loaf. You get sort of a crumbly... Cornbread loaf. And our caller, our question answer is back. Okay. Did, did you hear the answer to that, caller? I did not. I'm sorry. But my, my question was... Oh, gosh, we lost him again. I think it's his cell phone. He said he had lost it. Uh, I'm sorry. Try one more time, caller, and the lines are open otherwise. So if um, the caller is listening, Dr. Pete said yes, sprouting and or soaking, uh, specifically soaking the grain for 8 to 12 hours in like a, a sourdough starter or soaking the grain with the flour with the sourdough starter will help to break down a lot of indigestible toxic plant compounds. Okay, well, we're probably going to get him calling back, or maybe if he was on a cell phone, he's not in such good reception. Well, and the uh, protein <coughs> quantity actually increases because the, the gluten carries uh, so many nitrogen-rich amino acids, which uh, happen to make it hmm. more allergenic. But when the enzymes release the nitrogen from the gluten, those nitrogens can be used to make new, completely different proteins, so you get two to three times more protein substance. So people who are trying to avoid the heavy protein anti-inflammatory diet, and they're actually getting um, you know, a lot of grains in their diet, they're getting a lot of phosphorus, like you said, and uh, the same thing as if people eat just a lot of meat and not very many grains, they're getting a lot of phosphorus. So both of those diet spectrums are out of balance as far as calcium and healthy metabolism is concerned. Yeah, and the body can, in, at least in the short range, it can handle quite an imbalance. Uh, lots of Americans uh, have been growing up on a 7 to 1 phosphate to calcium ratio, uh, where milk is, is 1 to 3 in the 1.3 uh, to 1 in the other direction. Wow. Wow. And, uh, the, Probably the long-range optimum is something like that in milk, uh, somewhere between a ratio of 1 to 1 up to maybe even uh, 2 to 1 wow. in favor of calcium to phosphorus. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. We, we have another caller on the line, so let's take this next caller. You're on the air? Oh, yes, this is someone else. And um, since you've brought up raw milk and the FDA, I want to um, put this out. Uh, recently, a company called Rossum Foods in Southern California um, was busted by the FBI 
and the FDA, and uh, I call them the food rallies. And the the concern that I have is that the uh, basically, as opposed to bioavailability, the retail availability of getting some of these products that we would like to get, as you indicated, raw milk does have more nutrient value to it. Um, I'm curious as to uh, what we might be able to do uh, to preserve some of our access to these without governmental interference. In fact, uh, I am aware that there is a website dealing with these issues called Farm Food Freedom, and that's F-A-R-M as opposed to the pharmacy version that's sometimes shortened. So it's F-A-R-M Food Freedom. And lately I've been leaving the P off of pharmacy, by the way, P is in profit and pharmacy is in, well, what they seem to do best. <laughs> All right. Well, thank so you. So any response to that I'd appreciate. And, it, you know, it kind of speaks for itself. But if you want to uh, address that, I would appreciate it. And thanks for all that you do in making these things known, better understood, and available to us. All right. Thank you for your call. Dr. Pete, so, uh, so far as uh, the availability of raw milk is concerned, um, what, what perhaps would you like to see? Oh, well, it, um, everyone should have uh, a cow next door. <laughs> there you go. Okay, but and for people were... in the city? Uh... Uh, then a goat if you're in the city. <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go on the rooftop. <laughs> uh, my, my father um, built a barn when we lived in southern Oregon uh, that looked like a little college, cottage. <laughs> and uh, the cow uh, lived, ate it, got milked in this little house mm -hmm. and made the uh, neighborhood look more like a, a <laughs> residential <laughs> not a farm well you were mentioning um, to us earlier about the the pro pasteurization people and the, the the what they support is actually coming from the National Institutes of Health and the SAIC I can't remember what that acronym stands for oh well yeah, yeah the um, one of the articles uh, warning about the dangerous estrogen metabolites in milk uh, was uh, done by uh, this uh, partnership of uh, national uh, institutes for health with uh, the uh, science uh, applications international corporation i think it's called and uh, they are also effectively a branch of the homeland security agency and uh, military uh, defense project, uh, internet technology, uh, they, they actually sur just surveillance technology, and so on. So they, they just featured in a book I'm reading right now by Peter Dale Scott about the politics of heroin smuggling in C Southeast Asia, and they're very involved. The, the SAIC, SAI Security, something international consultants, and I. Uh, there's one more caller, and I unfortunately missed how that came up. But so, so basically, Doctor Pete, let me just finish up this subject here you're saying that these these organizations are pro pasteurization because they don't want to see people have their own cow in their backyard um it, i think the the motivation is is very complex but i think it's it's the new wave of what in the 1930s it was a, a big campaign nationally against breastfeeding babies and uh, uh, advocating early feeding of, of uh, beans and, and bread and so on. And uh, that is um, coming back in the ghettos first. Uh, they're telling women, uh, if they're Mexican uh, of origin, to um, wean their babies very early on beans. <laughs> and uh, I, th I think it's motivated by a kind of a class war to uh, make it cheaper uh, if they're going to keep having food stamps. They don't want people uh, buying uh, fancy food like milk and meat and eggs. Oh, my goodness. Okay, we do have another caller who's been waiting a while here, and it's 7.54, so we'll take this last caller. Hello, caller, you're on Hi. the air. Hi. Yes, I just had... I just had one brief question. Uh, would the phosphorus and calcium effect on our physiology be more wholesome if the milk were taken in the form of yogurt? Um, I'll take my answer off air. Uh, we're, 
you're about the types of yogurt, and Sarah mentioned, uh, what, what did you call it? Greek? Well, there's a, um, I've been looking into this yogurt thing because yogurt is essentially the same as milk in the quantities of protein, but it has a much, much higher lactic acid content, which is hard in your liver. And so there's this yogurt called Faye yogurt. F-A-G-E. F-A-G-E, Fage or whatever. Faye, but it's Greek. It says on there, it's Greek strained yogurt. And when you make cheese, you strain the whey out and out goes the lactic acid. And when you make yogurt, you retain the lactic acid rich whey normally. Normal American yogurt retains the lactic acid rich whey. So this Faye yogurt has... 23 grams of protein per cup, which means they have to strain out the whey in order to concentrate the casein and the cheese-like protein in the yogurt because they don't have any thickeners in it. And so that's a yogurt that's not tart because most of the whey, the lactic acid-rich whey, has been strained out, which makes it tart. And actually, it's not good to have a tart yogurt and to replace milk with the yogurt. Because of the harmful effect on the liver. One and more, I think the, the lactic acid, besides burdening your liver, uh, causing a tendency to uh, hypoglycemia from not storing enough glycogen, lactic acid also produces fibrosis, inflammation, and uh, even contributes to the, cal- the cancer metabolism. Okay, there is one last caller. See if we can squeeze him in ever so quickly without going over time. So okay. Ro- Hello? Yeah, I, you had mentioned serotonin, and you usually say it like that, this, that the serotonin is bad, and I've always heard that serotonin was good because it's like a feel-good hormone, and it uh, makes you not depressed. So what is wrong with serotonin? Um, well, it, um, if you look at uh, studies of aggression in dogs, they, they treat them with these um, uh, SSRI uh, drugs, and they find that uh, after a few weeks, when their aggression has subsided, uh, their serotonin has gone down. Uh, so the drugs that are sold supposedly to raise serotonin, uh, when they work, uh, they might actually be lowering your serotonin. And uh, serotonin is a, a, a hormone of withdrawal, anxiety, and uh, uh, suppressing metabolism, lowering your demands. It's a kind of an emergency uh, anti-stress hormone that is necessary in uh, in context, but uh, when you're chronically stressed, it's what causes uh, uh, stomach ulcers, uh, contributes to fibrosis of every system, uh, scleroderma, for example, hardening of the arteries, osteoporosis. Uh, the last couple of years, it's recognized as probably the main uh, immediate uh, contributor to osteoporosis, uh, which is associated with depression and many other conditions, which are actually high serotonin conditions. So we would uh, advise people not to use serotonin. And not to use whey protein powder because it's highly oxidized and the um, amino acids in whey are mainly tryptophan, which is the um, precursor amino acid to make serotonin. Okay. But one other thing I just want to say is the serotonin is we've just been brainwashed to believe that serotonin is a feel-good hormone because the drug companies wanted to sell us the SSRIs, which don't actually, doesn't they don't appear to be raising the serotonin, they appear to be lowering it. And those patents are expiring, so mm. they'll be coming out with a new kind of antidepressant, <laughs> and so we'll stop hearing so much about the And then we'll have to, to research that. <laughs> But th- thank, thank you so much for joining us again, Dr. P. I know people really enjoy what it is you have to say. And it is a, uh, uh, an education where many things that we hear, we have to hear and rehear before we recognize that what we're hearing is actually the truth and uh, start changing our habits and our lifestyles. But for those people who've heard Dr. Pete this time round and who've uh, asked him on the show time and time again asking questions and shooting him questions personally, his website is www raypeat r-a-y-p-e-a-t dot com plenty of articles scholarly articles referenced uh, there's lots of information there that you'd be doing good to uh, look at and take on board okay so until the third friday uh, of next month uh, you can reach us toll free on 1-888-WBM-HERB for further questions during normal business hours monday through friday uh, until the uh, harvest moon month 
next month. Uh, good night to you all. Good night, and thank you for listening. Support for KMUD comes in part from Golden Dragon Medicinal Syrup, an anti-inflammatory, antifungal, antibacterial, antioxidant medicine made without heat or ice. Golden Dragon Medicinal Syrup is an organic, edible, topical, cosmetic, and water-soluble. Information is available at Golden Dragon. Please remember that this program is supported by the listener members of Redwood Community Radio. If you like what you hear, please consider becoming a member of KMUD or renewing if you've already joined. A regular yearly membership is $50, but we accept any amount. Help us keep free speech alive.